Welcome to Decoding the Conflict Mindset, podcast that airs twice per month. This particular episode, I'm delighted to bring to you as Dr. Dupree, host and founder of the DCM podcast, an episode that is designed to enlighten your minds and widen your perspectives about the application of mediation. To join me in that journey is Matthew Carroll. Matthew himself has a very unique background in that he started his career and continues his career as a performing artist. He has sung in productions throughout the world and has held some very unique roles and opportunities. He continues to sing for the Chicago Bulls, even to this day. But during his time in the Performing Arts Union, he was exposed to the field of negotiation and quickly became very embedded in union contract negotiations. It was with that exposure that intrigued him about the field of mediation, and he has since been a full-time mediator for the last eight years. What's unique about this is not only do we talk about how our respective backgrounds have led us into mediation and the joy that we found in helping people navigate through conflict, but also how mediation can be applied to all kinds of conflicts and disputes, whether it be workplace issues, family situations, divorce, parenting plans, not to mention the performing arts. Who would have thought? way beyond the typical civil or commercial litigation kinds of mediations. We'll talk a little bit about the lawyer advocate, the lawyer mediator, and the mediator who comes from a diverse background such as Matthew and I do. So stay tuned. We're going to be starting very shortly, Decoding the Conflict Mindset, today with Matthew Carroll. Mediation, a unique art form. If you haven't already subscribed, please do so so you're notified of our next upcoming episode in two more weeks. And also, let your friends know you've got a couple of minutes before we get started. Welcome to Decoding the Conflict Mindset. I'm your host and founder, Dr. Deborah Dupree, the Mindset Doc. And I'm so delighted to have with me today, Matthew Carroll. Welcome, Matthew. Hi, Dr. D. How are you? Absolutely wonderful. It's always so fun to come together with such great thought leaders. And I know we met re- re- relatively recently. And, uh, um, you know, I just love the mindset that you're coming into the field of mediation with and uh, a very interesting journey along the way. And so we're going to come back to that in a moment. But that's going to be the focus of our our. Um, episode today uh, for our listeners is mediation, a unique art form. Uh, because, you know, one thing, Matthew, um, that still strikes me, I don't know why it does, but, you know, I've been in mediation for over 35 years. And I remember way back in the 90s and the early t- 2000s, it's like, why don't more people know about mediation? Why aren't they using it to help resolve their differences, whether it's in family or divorce or workplace or civil or whatever? rather than pursuing litigation. Mm-hmm. It just it continues to astound me um, how much people don't know about mediation. So I, I look so forward to um, hearing your perspective and, and again, your journey to get here. So tell us a little bit about your story. Well, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we're a little biased about what we do because we see the rewards and we see the positive um uh, uh, outcomes with with the people that we work with. And so it's an easy sell uh, with mediation. But yeah, I, I often ask myself those questions too. Why doesn't everybody mediate? Um, a little bit about my background. So I uh, went uh, to a small university outside of Cleveland, Ohio, Baldwin Wallace University. I majored in music uh, performance. I did musical theater and opera. Um, I started singing my senior year of high school and I loved it. My mother made me try out for the high school musical. Uh, I I was playing on the basketball team and I hurt my knee and my mom said, well, you're not going to sit around the house and mope. So go try out for the musical. So I tried out for the musical. I ended up getting the lead role, which was great and super exciting. Uh, but I went to uh, BW for business, but then I, I quickly uh, auditioned for the high school or for the uh, musical there at the college. 
and the director of the program said, who are you and why are you not in my program? So that quickly uh, made me change majors. I ended up getting a master's in vocal performance at the University of Michigan, as well as a specialist in voice degree from the University of Michigan. It's like a pre-doctorate. Um, and then I started singing all around the world professionally. Uh, super exciting. I sang in Australia and Germany, Italy, England, um, and here in the United States. I did a lot in Colorado, and I did uh, a good bit, obviously, here in the Chicagoland area. I lived in New York City, as most artists do. Uh, so that was my uh, very exciting. And then back way back in 2002... I was offered a full-time position in the ensemble here at the Lyric Opera of Chicago in Chicago, Illinois. Um, and it was it's a very prestigious company. It's only one of three companies that hire a full-time ensemble. So if you think about all of the music majors from all of the colleges across the country, um, it's a very specialized art form. It's a very specialized um, thing that we do. And to only have 148 full-time positions across the United States is it's very difficult to get in and it's very competitive. So I think I was uh, one of 20 some people that had made it to the finals. The original auditions were something like they, they had heard over a hundred singers for this spot. And then they weeded it down to 20 spots. And then I was invited. I was one of the 20 and then I was the one that was selected for the spot. So, um, I started singing with them. We do we did music theater, a lot of uh, uh, opera, obviously in different languages. Super exciting to collaborate with artists from around the world and get different perspectives from people from from Europe and uh, uh, you know Africa, and uh, it was just really eye opening. Uh, I come from a small town north of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, so to be uh, thrusted into this world was exciting and invigorating and addictive. Um, you know, who doesn't like being in the spotlight? It was super fun. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things that I found relatively quickly is that um, there's another factor involved with the performing arts world, and that's negotiating contracts. Yeah. And so um, very quickly, I think the, the at the time, the president of the National Union was also in the ensemble with me here in Chicago. And he quickly uh, recruited me as uh, a negotiator for uh, the contract. And it was the most maddening, frustrating process I've ever experienced. And it's also sad because you're excited uh, about doing what you do and you're passionate and you love it. And it's, and then when you go into the negotiations and, and you're sitting across the table for management and you realize that you're just a number <laughs> and they don't really care about you, it, it's sad. And also it was my introduction to traditional positional bargaining where one side says, we want to raise, and the other side says, we want you to take a pay cut, and everybody just sits there with their arms closed, and they just say no to everything else, and nothing gets done. And you waste hours on end until the federal mediator comes in, and that's when things start happening. That's when the negotiations really start. You start looking at the needs and the interests so that was my first introduction to mediation. So then I became more involved in the negotiations in future years. And I finally asked the federal mediator at the time, I said, if I promised not to talk about negotiations, may I please go out to coffee with you? Because I love this. I love this mediation. I love what you do. And I want to pick your brain to figure out how you do that. So um, I quickly started developing my second passion, and that was mediation. So I started doing some research and following the advice of the federal mediator on where to go to school and what kind of degree uh, to what kind of training is required and things of that nature. Um, I enrolled at Northwestern University, and the very first class I took there was their negotiation class 
that was taught by Dan Shapiro from uh, the Harvard program on negotiations. Sure. And Dan has a fantastic simulation called Sally Soprano. And it's negotiating a Sopranos contract. And the Soprano was going to be singing at the Lyric Opera of Chicago. So when I raised my hand and I said, hey, listen, everything about this sim is wrong. <laughs> should, should Like, I kind of know. <laughs> I said, should I just go with this? Or, yeah, like, you know, how should I? Should I play it how it's written? And he he chuckled and said, you should play it how it's written. So uh, then I took a couple other classes and then fast forward, gosh, almost, let's see here, about eight years. And now I'm teaching the divorce mediation class at Northwestern, Medi at Northwestern University. And the funny thing is, is Dan came back last summer uh, to teach the negotiations class. He had taken a few years off because of COVID, so they weren't offering it in person. And he came back and he was talking to the dean and said, I'll never forget that guy that that took uh, the negotiations class and, it, and he was from the Lyric Opera. And the dean said to him, well, you want to hear something crazier? He's now teaching the divorce mediation class. And Dan said, how wonderful. That is just like it's full circle. So, yeah, it's a it's a weird background. Nobody would ever guess. And I never tell my clients what my former life used to look like um some of them will find me uh on youtube and a couple other places but for the most part well, uh, yeah go yeah, ahead okay so so matthew I, I thought that maybe you might burst out into song Whoa! Yeah. Uh, <laughs> to change the tone of the mediation when things can't get pay me enough <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, maybe I'll have to ask for a special um, um, showing or something like that because, right? uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I just, I find, you know, uh, I think your story is just so fascinating and, um, uh, and I'll just share a snippet of my background in that regard because I was doing a certain kind of work and then, you know, federal and state laws change and all of a sudden I'm having union reps and attorneys that what were my supervisor employer um negotiations on you know return to work after an injury and I thought I need more skills I need more skills and this was back in the early 90s mm -hmm. and that's how I stumbled into mediation and I'm, I'm going oh my gosh this is a whole other field out there and oh I just loved it you know and and like you I've been an active teacher of the process and bringing professionals in and speak on it all the time but yeah it and that's what I hope to get across to people today is that um you know how often do people go meditation no, mediation. Okay. There might be a meditation part to it, but it's really mediation. Um, but it, it is really such a fruitful, productive way of navigating through difficult situations that mm. I just wish more people would take advantage of it. Well, and you know, I do mostly, uh, well, in Indiana, I do mostly divorce mediations. And then in, in, in Illinois, I do mostly civil mediations. But the interesting thing about what you just said that a lot of people still don't know about it. It that is, it's still our biggest challenge is getting mediation into the mainstream. There's not a lot of television shows or movies or, like you said, is this meditation? Is it mediation? What is it? And then it's like, well, then are you a lawyer? Well, if you're not a lawyer, how can you do this? And so there's a lot of confusion and some misnomers and some misinformation that's out there that mm -hmm. kind of goes against us. But you know, with divorce, I say all the time to clients, um, did an attorney walk you down the aisle in the church? You know, most likely no, unless their dad was an attorney, um, but most likely no. And so, you know, we work with attorneys all the time uh, as mediators, but also you, you know, I think it's something like 74% I recently read of, uh, of litigants in divorce, at least one uh, party is 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 pro se doesn't have representation that's three almost three out of four people are now choosing not to be represented but gosh just having that professional help of a third party neutral to help navigate some of those conversations it truly is the best way to go because you're putting control of the process in their hands mm -hmm. You know, in litigation, you're going to court, you're having judges make those decisions. And and I know enough judges now personally that they don't want to make these decisions. They'd rather, you know, these people be empowered and 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 um make these decisions on their own. But 
as you kind of referred to earlier, is one, people haven't heard of it. And two, it just seems like an insurmountable amount of things to cover. Mm -hmm. And, and it is, I like to use a lot of, um, a lot of like pictures and a lot of analogies, especially physical analogies to kind of help set the scene. And with a lot of my clients, especially in um, like a consultation, I'll say, if you take a 2000 piece puzzle and dump it onto a table, it looks overwhelming. Half the parts are upside down. Um, it's like, how am I ever going to build this puzzle? But then you start building that frame. And before you know it, you have a frame done. And then you start sorting out the pieces. And then before you know it, when you do little bits at a time, you have a completed puzzle by the end. And that's not dissimilar to what we do. It's it's a lot of stuff. And especially when you're talking divorce, right? Because there's just so many layers to divorce and especially with children. And there's so much fear. I recently read that the human brain can't fully comprehend a divorce. It's too much for the human brain to accept all at once. I mean, you're talking about the potential of relocation and moving and financial concerns and concerns about safety and concerns about um, your children and education concerns and healthcare concerns. And it's just, when you think about it, even me saying the list of things that we cover, it's overwhelming. I even start to notice within my own body that I, I start rising up and I'm starting to get tense because it's just too much. Yeah. So the easiest way to do it is to just break it down. You break it down to little pieces at a time. And we we don't meet with clients more than two hours at a time. After about two hours, I start to see our clients' as eyes. Yeah. Oh yeah, they're 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 done. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, there's other mediators that have their own methods and and that's okay. But to me, that's torture to force two people to sit in a room for that long of a period of time to make these decisions. Does it ultimately maybe get to the end sure but is that a band-aid or is that a true solution because it might just it might work for today but is that gonna what's that durability gonna look like for that family long term right um and i would hate that somebody made some sort of decision in duress yes. because those types of decisions are usually not an educated decision that's going to be more of a uh um an emotional decision. And we're trying to eliminate those emotional decisions. You know, this is an emotional enough process as it is. So why don't we name it? What emotions you're feeling, mm -hmm. normalize it and say, it doesn't make it any easier, but most of my couples that come in here express something very similar. Yeah. And well, we're done. Yeah. And on that note, Matthew, I mean, you, you talked about all the tangible pieces of, you know, breaking, uh, breaking apart the lifestyles of two people and, and then children if they're involved, you know, the legal aspects, the health and education, you know, the housing, the ge geography, et cetera, like that. Those are all the tangible aspects. But what a lot of people don't realize, you know, or, and maybe they do, um, and, and yet, you know, that you know the a divorce or the ending of a marriage is is a loss and mm -hmm. it's very similar as we now know psychologically uh and neuroscientifically that it's a very akin to the death of a loved one it's just the death of a marriage and um and so there's a lot of grief that goes into this and so that's what i try to bring to the table in teaching you know um professional mediators and lawyers who become mediators that uh, as my good friend and colleague Harold Coleman always says, there's always two aspects to a legal case, and divorce is a legal process. You're you're just engaging a, a contract, um, but there's the the factual part, like you were just talking about, and then there's the mm -hmm. emotional part. And unless you prepare to deal with the emotional part, um, that that whole negotiation of the factual parts may become even more complicated, more difficult to get through because of the emotional components behind it. Absolutely. And that's where it's going to be helpful for the practitioner to be familiar with the stages of grief. Mm -hmm. um, I even put the stages of grief in my welcome packet because it's not uncommon that somebody will come in and say, I don't want this divorce. Mm -hmm. How can they just throw 30 years away? But when you 
when you show them the stages of grief, they're mourning the loss of their marriage and they're already at the acceptance phase. Yeah. The person that just found out that the other person wants the divorce, they're at the denial or anger phase, right? right? So they're in two different worlds mm -hmm. when it comes to like their mindset. The intervention needed to happen two years ago or whenever the first person, whenever the person that's done was reaching the anger or the denial phase. Like that's where the intervention needed to happen. And it's it's unfortunate because you think of, of how much, if somebody could have just intervened at the right time, how many of those relationships could have been saved. There was a recent study done where they polled people who have recently been divorced. And 80% of the people said that if they would have gotten intervention at some point earlier in their marriage, it probably would have prevented that divorce. And that was so sad to me. And that's something, I don't know how much of this you do, but like we also do relationship mediations. Right. Um, and I kind of stumbled into that on accident. I had a couple that came in for a free divorce consultation, but they both sat down and said, we're not really sure why we're here. Yeah. We don't think we're ready for a divorce. We just know that something needs to change. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, well, what do you think needs to change? And then we just started a conversation. And before you know it, I was typing up an agreement that they agreed to like a dedicated date night. Um, mm -hmm. They were both going to get individual counseling. They agreed to do couples counseling once a week. Um, the husband agreed to, to shut off certain programming at night that was causing him to get angry. Um, and they worked out a really nice arrangement. I also gave them Bill Eddy's book, um, Biff, on how to communicate more healthy. Um, and I said, just bring it back when you're done reading it. And the husband, I didn't hear another word from them for about two months. And then about two months later, the husband sent me a gift card saying, if you don't mind, I'd like to keep this book. It's been extremely helpful, but I want to at least pay you for it. Yeah. So he gave me a gift card for Amazon to replenish the Biff book. And, you know... Mm -hmm. It's moments like that. It's like, just because I do divorce doesn't mean I'm pro-divorce, right? Exactly. And just I think because... that's, yeah, I think that that's a very important message to put out there is that I've, I've certainly had that question coming in more as a therapist and psychologist to say, well, you're just promoting divorce. It's like, no, I'm not. People have already made that decision before they get to me. Um, although it might, like you were saying, you sort of stumbled into the relationship. I was already sort of there and then moved into the divorce. Um, but what what happened, and I probably worked with many more couples in helping them look at how to save their marriage. What can they do differently than actually helping them move forward with the divorce? And yeah. um, and so that, that's why it's so important. Is like, yeah, can this can this marriage be salvaged? And uh, what would it take to do? And if you've already made the decision to divorce, then how can we do that in the healthiest, cleanest kind of way? It's going to be painful. You know, no doubt about it, because it's a loss of something you've had. But yeah. how can we do that in a way that you're taking care of yourself, you're taking care of each other, you're taking care of the process? Um, before we move on, Matthew, um, I want to make sure that people understand what this means. Yeah, brief, informative, friendly, uh, factual, and firm. Yes. Um, and that is Bill Eddy's book on teaching people how to communicate in a more healthy way. And especially, I think in my opinion, from what I've seen is that those emotions are raw mm -hmm. when you're getting divorced, but eventually you get to a different place. And hopefully when you get to that different place, if you can start, if, if in the mediation, I can introduce a healthier way to communicate, at least for now, right? You're business partners now. You've got yeah. these two children or these three kids that you're responsible for. And it now that you're not married and not living in the same house, it's going to require healthy, informative, factual and firm communication, right? right. I will be there. I will drop them off. Uh, So-and-so has dance tonight. Can you pick them up? Thank you. It doesn't have to be long. It can be short, but very bullet point. And yeah. um, you, you strip out that emotional response out of that, right? Because that's not helpful that's when those triggers kick in that's when it's like hey listen i i don't have to to put up with this anymore right. that's why we're getting and ultimately if the mediation can help set that up mm -hmm. can set up that healthier way to communicate gosh what a wonderful way 
for their children. And, and, you know, I remind my clients often, I said, you are modeling a healthy way to dissolve your relationship mm -hmm. to your children. You could choose a different route. You could litigate and you could fight until your heart's content. And, but eventually that trickles down to the children, right? They don't get a seat at the table and that's not fair to them. Mm -hmm. And they're the they're the ping pong ball in this factor. And so if we can help the parents succeed as co-parents moving forward through the mediation process, then we are truly doing a service that is invaluable to these clients. Yes. Yes. I want to go back to, you know, we, we call this mediation a truly unique art form. And um and you've touched on a few things already, and I would like to share at this point, you know, you do, you know, as a mediator, you do need to be able to think outside the box and draw upon different tools, whether it's metaphors, whether it's visuals or whatever. One mm -hmm. of the things I oftentimes will say is that if you, in fact, have chosen to proceed with the divorce, here's the mindset that needs to shift because mm -hmm. now you have chosen to to leave this marital union. So it's about disengaging from what was the intimate personal relationship you had with this other person and learning to re-engage in what is now the business of parenting mm -hmm. along your BIF model in terms of how you carry this out for the kids moving forward. Because yeah. continuing to be angry at each other, calling each names doesn't cut it. In fact, I just counseled somebody earlier today. Um, uh, so one of the, the tactics I have is one at this point, stop calling my wife or my husband. You're choosing, you've chosen to uh, disengage that relationship. Mm -hmm. And even using personal names can feel too personal sometimes. And so this is the mother of my child. This is mm -hmm. the father of my child. And that's mm -hmm. the roles that you play now. And the more you keep that in mind is that if it were not for her, if it was not for him, we wouldn't have this child about mm -hmm. how we're trying to make plans to move forward. It's so hard to disengage. It's really hard because, I mean, we go back to what was modeled to us as children, mm -hmm. right? And we go back to, I don't know about you, but I think um, anytime somebody reminds them of maybe who they used to be, it causes something that we don't like in ourselves, and then because that person is basically saying, this is what you used to be like, it causes that explosion in our head. Like, well, how dare you? I've I've moved forward. I've worked on myself. I'm proud of that hard work. And how dare you come back? So it's hard to disengage from that. And certain if you've been married long enough, there are certain triggers that that spouse or soon to be ex-spouse, they know how to exploit. And even as the mediator, we may not know what that trigger is. Or, you know, I, I had a client that said, do you see how they're looking at me right now? This is yeah. what I'm talking about. And I'm like, how are they looking at you? Because yeah. I don't have that history, right? Yeah. I've never met you until three weeks ago. Yeah. How am I going to know that, right? But thank you. Thank you for sharing that this kind of look is, is, is a negative reaction that you're experiencing. Yeah. But I want to circle back to the art form that you mentioned. So as a music major, we were uh, um, we were exposed to many different art forms, you know, music theater, opera, classical singing, um, uh, symphonic music, uh, recitals, art songs. There's all these different types of art forms. And mediation's no different. Um, you know, I, you look at the different models, for example, I think the evaluative model, I call that the paint by number model because it <laughs> It's within the structure. Yeah, it is. It's a paint by number, right? So because it's going to follow the statutes, it's going to follow the guidelines. It's kind of like what most attorneys and judges are going to use as their starting point. You know, like, well, this is what the guidelines say. Well, if you use more of the evaluative model or the transformative model, um, that's going to be more, um, uh, or, or, or the facilitative model, that's going to be more of a blank canvas. These people are painting that picture and, and you can use that no matter if it's divorce or workplace, like what is this painting going to look like when you're done? Mm -hmm. What do you want it to look like? Right. Um, so it truly is its own unique art form because there's litigation, there's arbitration. But again, now you're just you're having a third party make decisions 
we're here to empower you to make these decisions. You're the expert of your life. Your attorney doesn't know you very well. The judge definitely doesn't know you. Why are you putting that into the hands of people that don't really know you? You know you. So let's work on that. And, you know, it's not uncommon that you'll say, well, you know, Dr. D, what would you do if you were in my situation? Mm -hmm. You know, or, or, hey, Matt, what do you think we should do with the kids? Mm -hmm. I'll half jokingly say, well, I think you should cut them in half and dad should get the torso and mom should get the legs. And that's why you don't want me making decisions for your kids. So what do you want to do with the kids? Yeah. yeah. You know, because I think it's almost like, there's so many different things. And if you look at Dan Shapiro's book where he defines like the, the, the five roles of conflict, right? What, like what causes that conflict mm -hmm. and it's autonomy, it's, um, it's status, it's role. It's um, I know I'm going to forget the other two. Cause I always do, but yeah. uh, Oh shoot. Well, regardless, but if you look at those five things, you can see one, why they're getting divorced. But two, what they need to address after the divorce or even in the workplace conflict, right? What do they need to address afterwards that's going to address their autonomy, that's going to address their role, their status, their affiliation? That's the other one. There's three that start with A, autonomy, affiliation, role, status, and oh, I always forget that fifth one. But it's easy to address that, right? So we can say, let's talk about role. You know, using that in a divorce context, it's not uncommon that in every family, everybody has roles. One mm -hmm. person pays the bills, the other mows, the other does laundry, the other does this, the one person takes the kids to the doctors, you know, and no, no relationships the same. Like the, the mediator can, they have to come in again with that blank canvas every single time. Cause you can't assume that the roles are similar. You know, uh, I made that mistake once where it's like, oh, this couple's very similar to this couple. And then about halfway through, I'm like, they're nothing like this couple. Yeah. <laughs> they're all unique um, individuals that's... and unique relationships. Yeah. But then after that divorce, that role changes, right? Because you once relied on that person to do half the stuff. And now you're responsible for 100% and the other person's responsible for 100%. So we have to talk about it. We have to yeah. navigate those waters. Status is big, right? After a divorce, people lose friends. Um, you can't afford the country club anymore or whatever it is, whatever that status is. Maybe it's your church. Um, maybe be because certain religions uh, view divorce as like a, a, a scarlet letter, right? It's like, well, gosh, that really affects my status yeah. or my role or my affiliation, right? Mm -hmm. So then we have to address those areas. Um and so this is where it's just as a practitioner, my biggest advice, and I teach this at Northwestern too, is be curious. You have two human beings that are suffering in some way sitting in front of you, whether it's civil or divorce, workplace, um, if they have any, even landlord tenant, they have some sort of relationship together, right? And so we have to define that relationship and, and just being curious, what made you pick this apartment in the first place? Right. What right. was it about the neighborhood that you liked? Um, or tell me about your children, because yeah. who doesn't like to talk about their kids, you yeah. know? Yeah. And one of the things I, I call that a jump ball question, and it's a great tool to use because if you just look like you can see my setup here where I'll look at the clock and I'll say, tell me about your children. I wait to see who answers first, because usually the person who answers first is, is going to be the one that has the power in the relationship. Mm -hmm. It signifies to me that, aha, I need to pay attention to this power imbalance. This person has answered first three times in a row. So I'm going to need to make sure that this other person is being heard. Right. And you're looking for those nonverbal cues. Like, is the person closed off? Did they start shaking their leg? Are they clicking a pen all of a sudden? These are all tools in our, you, you'd mentioned the tools in our tool belt. Right. So many tools that we yeah. have. So going, uh, taking it from another perspective too, because you, you know, you talked about affiliation and, mm -hmm. um, in, in one of the questions I wanted to ask you, and then I, I have a little story I would like to add, um, but we, we know that cultures, different cultures also 
uh, have certain values and attitudes about marriage and therefore divorce. And mm -hmm. so, um, uh, you know, that that is another component to keep in mind and it can also affect the power and the status and all that kind of thing. I um, had the uh, fortunate opportunity recently to run across a movie I'd seen a couple of years or so ago, maybe even longer. And I was interested in it because one, I really liked the acting of Andy Garcia, uh, but then Gloria Estefan was also in there, and it really emphasized, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, coming across from Cuba into Miami, and then the success that they made in their lives. Um, but you know, then you know, roles evolved, and um, it became a not a very happy marriage, and so mm -hmm. they were contemplating divorce as their oldest was announcing their 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 wedding. And, um, and so it was just an interesting thing, you know, they were ready to, you know, call it quits, particularly the wife. And yet, you know, because of a certain series of events that transpired, et cetera, um, it had a powerful impact on him. And so they ultimately were able to resurrect, but there was a lot of that influence about, we don't get, we don't get divorced as Cubans. We don't, that's not what we do in our religion, you know, and, um, and then again, the hierarchy of the roles and things like that. So, um, you know, I guess, you know, I was just sharing a, a movie about that because I love watching movies to see the kinds of stories that they bring out. And, um, and they, they had been working with somebody to try to mediate, you know, couples counseling kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, in, in the transformation that can happen, because I think that can be insightful for people to say it doesn't have to go this route. There are other examples. And like when you were uh, saying earlier that if somebody asked you, well, Matt, what would you do? Or Dr. D, what would you do? And I said, well, I could tell you what I would do, but that doesn't really fit here because I'm not you. But I can share with you what other couples have done, other parents have done that I've worked with because maybe there's some insight that might be relevant to your situation. Mm -hmm. And so I will share stories and I even use movies as a result of sharing stories. Yeah. I mean, again, that's one of those many tools in our tool belt. And we, we jokingly said meditation, but you know, I had a client one time who asked if we could have sessions on Sunday afternoons because he's most at peace after he attends mass. Oh. And I wasn't able to facilitate that meeting time every week. We were able to, to work a couple out, but it made me wonder, because I was curious. I was like, well, I wonder what it is about mass that puts him at peace. So I asked him that and he said, well, I like the music and I like the, the, the smell of the incense and, uh, and I, and, and the darkness of the church. So before our next session, when they came in, I said, I'm not going to charge you for the first 10 minutes because I want to just try something. And if you think this is hokey, that's okay. I said, but we're going to start off with a 10 minute meditation. Mm -hmm. And I pulled it up on an app that I have on my phone. I dimmed the lights down. We did 10 minutes of meditation to start off. And it went really well. The whole session went well. And wouldn't you know it, at our next session, when they walked in the door, the husband said, do you mind if we start again with that 10 minute meditation? That was a complete, I tried that. I was like, let's just try it and see what happens. But again, I was curious to, I'm just gonna pull this tool out of the tool belt and see if it works. And again, this is kind of like that blank canvas, right? You know, I might have to paint over it if I make a mistake <laughs> and that's okay. Yeah. I mean, the nice thing is though, at the end of the day, it solved the problem. Mm -hmm. There was less um, tension. They worked well together. And you and I had discussed previously, like just getting couples to connect and getting people to connect. Yes. You know, oftentimes it's just, we don't have a healthy way of communicating anymore, you know, mm -hmm. through text or social media or Snapchat or Facebook Messenger, but it's it's rarely in person anymore. And then when we do have that conversation in person, it's awkward. And so sometimes you just need the help of a third party neutral to kind of come in and help with that conversation. And it's like, hey, the stuff that you posted on social media, look now firsthand what kind of effect that has had on this person. Would you like to explain to them when you read this, how that affected you? How has it affected your the workplace, the office? Um, what has that done? You know, and a lot of times HR, 
they're handcuffed at what they're able to do. They're there to protect the company's liability. But are they truly neutral, right? Because they're being paid by <laughs> the same person that you're in conflict with. So sometimes like having that third party, like an ombuds person or a mediator come in to do workplace mediation can be so much more fruitful. Yes, I absolutely agree. Um, because sometimes you just need that third party perspective. And and I'll oftentimes have people say, Well, I've said that before. It's like, well, sometimes it's it's not it's it's the messenger that can make the difference, you know. Um, and just hearing it from somebody else's perspective can hugely influence. And so I one thing I always um uh encourage mediators to keep in mind that people coming into a, a mediation, you know, there's fear. There's anxiety or anxiousness. And so um, that's why I become a strong proponent of pre-mediation as mm -hmm. well as is, uh, let, letting the parties start developing a connection with me as their mediator, building trust, um, getting to know them, what are their fears, what are their underlying concerns, and um, and then also where I can help build out some connections. And uh, and I've used that in the workplace successfully many times and, and certainly with families. And uh, it just prepares them better to engage because it's scary. It's scary to go sure. into a room with somebody they're in conflict with. So Matthew, this has been exciting and wonderful. And I, I, I think filled with lots of nuggets. Um, what's one or two things that you might share with our audience um, as far as uh, you know their steps toward mediation? Oh, wow. One or Just two, Matthew. <laughs> one or two. Yeah. So again, I think like be curious, right? Um, that's the biggest thing. It's if you were in these people's shoes, how would that affect you? Right. And just so that's it's not necessarily for you to figure out how to solve their problems. It's a it's basically for you to understand how you can ask the most effective questions, mm -hmm. um, because that's the key is how the practitioner can ask the most effective questions to get the parties to understand. Right. So that that would be my first tip. My second tip um, for like a newer mediator is pick the brains of people like yourself that have been in this field for a really long time, pick network with other people, learn shadow. Um, one of the wonderful things that I get as a teacher is I, I, I have my students observe a real mediation with me, but then I ask them for feedback about what are some things that I could have done differently. Mm -hmm. Is there anything I might've missed? And it's kind of a way that I can get a little performance review Sure. Um, so again, like pick the brains of people that have been doing this a long time, because ideally I don't want to mediate like you or like others. I want to take borrow all these things that I've learned to form my own route. Um, I tell that to my students all the time. I'm going to give you feedback and I'm going to, I'm going to, um, give you some ideas of where I think you could have done things differently, or maybe where a, a more effective question could have been asked. But at the end of the day, I don't want you to mediate like Matthew Carroll. I want you to mediate like you. I just want you to take what works from me that you see that, oh yeah, that resonates with me and borrow it. This is one of the most generous fields I've ever been in. I mean, like, and you're one of them. Uh, I have so many just valued mentors in this field that I am so appreciative of and so thankful for um, their time and their gifts and their willingness to like share and share so willingly. Um, there's no way I could be where I am today if it wasn't for all of these people that shared those gifts. And they usually share them for free yeah. because we are all an advocate of this process. Like we said, I mean, we're going full circle back to the beginning of this conversation. Right. This works. It works well. It's effective. It might take time. And a lot of our lawyer friends struggle with that time, you know, and they struggle with the emotional side of it. Um, they want to get it done. And I understand that there's something to be said about that. They're representing a client and they want to get it done. And a lot of my judge friends will say a, a, a happy case is a closed case. But if you're empowering these people to make these decisions, informed decisions, you know, we'd mentioned impasse earlier in a previous discussion, impasse is just because they don't have enough information on the table to make it an informed decision. Right, so right. we 
as practitioners have to figure out, okay, how do we get them to get that information? Right. I'll and so they... the mediation process can really, you know, offer people an opportunity to do that. Because I like to say, you know, it's about repairing, restoring, mending relationships when those ongoing relationships are important. And it's not just the relationship with the other person. It's also the relationship with yourself. Because imagine the success that you will feel when you have navigated through a difficult conversation, a difficult relationship and actually come out better on the other side. Yeah. And, you know, and with mediators, I think, you know, we, we are so willing to share and to help people get better at this uh, and improve and, and reach more people because bottom line, we're really all interested in bringing peace to the table, to lives, to relationships, one conflict at a time. Well, let me ask you this because I'm curious about your thoughts about this, but do you feel being a professional peacemaker is a superpower? That's an interesting question. And Matthew, we're going to have to come back to that because <laughs> we're taking our time and I don't want to exhaust our, our audience here, uh, but that's a great question for a follow-up. And yeah. I have I have insights and I have thoughts that we'd be here for another twenty minutes and I don't I don't think our audience would appreciate an hour long <laughs> podcast. <laughs> okay. Well, that's so a good to leave it because um, I am so thankful for this opportunity and for our chat and uh, gosh I really hope somebody uh, learned something new today um, and I'm so thankful for you and your uh, advice and your mentorship and your time and your gift of time. So thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity. Well, thank you, Matthew, and uh, delight having you. I'm just going to throw out one little thing before we wrap up and close. Matthew has not ended his performing arts career. Matthew still sings for the Chicago Bulls and then the... I can't remember the other team in Chicago area. Chicago uh, Fire, the professional soccer. Here on C Live, look mm -hmm. them up in Chicago. Please do. Please yeah. do. Well, thank you everyone for being here. Um, you know, we went a little longer than usual, but as you can see, we both get pretty passionate about this topic and, and hope that we shared some insights that will make you want to use mediation for your next dispute or conflict instead of running off to the litigation table. And so pass this on to others that you feel might be moved or touched by our topic today. And uh, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, let us know what you liked about this in the comment section below. Uh, give, a, give a shout out to Matt or a comment about what he had to say and, and certainly anything I can do to help continue to improve the quality and uh, messaging of this podcast. So Dr. Deborah Dupree, the Mindset Doc, thank you for joining us. Well, I hope you enjoyed the interview with Matthew Carroll as much as I did. Uh, it was such a delight to, to meet him uh, through some common channels and uh, fascinating to hear about his performing arts career and how negotiating with union contracts led him into the field of mediation and he still performs amazing well we're going to take a shift and i'm sure all of you have heard about the imposter syndrome you know the, the fake it till you make it kind of approach and dr sharon lamb hartford has been addressing this issue for quite a long time and through her years of research and experience and practice working with corporate cultures uh, throughout the world, she has come up with what she calls the Authenticity Code and, uh, and has a book by that same name. And so what Dr. Sharon does is walks us through how to go beyond, you know, faking it till you make it to really be a solid individual uh, of who you are and what you're about. And then how she takes leaders into making that happen for their organizations. So please mark your calendar. She will be our first guest in 2024. So mark your calendars for the second Thursday of January. Happy holidays in the meantime.